Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. So this week we're talking about uh, China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam in in this last chapter, in this latest chapter. And this is uh, chapter 17, week 5. So last week we looked at the Mideast and we looked at these uh, Muslim empires. So we looked at the Ottoman Empire and the Mughals. And um, I, I guess to kind of give you an overview, because I know this stuff gets confusing and it's sort of like, why are we looking at this things? these things? We're, we're, we're still in this mode where we're looking backwards a little bit. So, um, you know, it would be very much similar to you studying the history of the United States and learning about um, you know, the 13 colonies and the Revolutionary War in the 1700s and the Civil War. Um, if you can imagine this time period, only transfer it to Asia, that's what we're talking about. And the week prior, it's the same time period transferred to these Muslim empires. So we're really in this 1500, uh, 1600, 1700, 1800 sort of time frame. And the commonality between all civilizations is that as um, uh, colonialization happens, as industrialization happens, as things modernize, like roads are built, communications is established, um, that's when you see a decline in the old empires and a rise in these new empires. So that's kind of where we're at. And what we're doing right now is, this week, is we're saying, okay, what was going on in China and what was going on in Japan? Now, um, if nothing else, and again, we probably won't remember these empires or these dynasties, and it, it, it really might not be important unless we're going to become scholars of uh, Asian history at some point in our lives. But if we're not, um, the bigger picture is, hey, what is the overview of China and Japan in this time period sort of before modernization? And And the cool thing here is it's sort of like a living laboratory because... When you read about China and when you read about Japan, the big theme that's going to come across in Japan is this idea of unity that starts to happen in the 1600s um, under uh, a shogun named uh, Tokugawa. And, and Tokugawa is a powerful shogun. A shogun is, is sort of like an absolute ruler or a king, and a shogunate is sort of like a kingdom. And, and in Japan, since Japan is a much smaller country and the people are um, more homogenous, they're more the same, is able to unify uh, relatively smoothly, if you will, without major civil wars in the 1600, in the 1600s. So when you read about Tukaya, um, uh, Japan, to, sorry, Tukawa, Japan, uh, what we're really talking about is this period of time between the 1600s and the 1800s where Japan really comes together. And again, for a country where everyone's very similar in their customs, in their cultures, uh, very homogenous, it's a lot easier to unify under one person because everyone's basically the same. It's, it's, a, it's a broader community bond, if you will. In China, it's totally opposite of that. And when you read about China, the reading will be confusing only because you're going to be like, oh, here was one empire, here's another empire, here's people from the north, people from the south. And and so it is confusing. So I wouldn't really worry about uh, grasping any you know particular facts in China other than the ones that apply everywhere. And the point there is, opposite of Japan, China is really diverse. It's a huge area with a lot of different cultures. I mean, people in the north are different. They relate as, you know, Manchurians and, and people in the West are, are closer to, in the Hindu Kush region, they're, they're closer to Indians in some way. So, so there's a lot of diversity. And anytime there's diversity in a culture like there is China, especially when there's a territory that you really can't get a handle on because geographically it's too big, uh, it's going to be harder to unify. And I think once you read the China section in the text and the Japanese section in the text, you will realize hey, it's not that, that China's culture is that much different than Japan's, but the reason China can't unify as quickly is because they're just too big and just too diverse. And and we see that in our country right now, too. We see all of these diverse interests from from blue-collar workers to um, uh, to immigrants to um, you know issues at the Mexican border. Um, at the, the east and west coasts of this country are heavily Democrat. They're really different than the center of the country. So, so these cultural and regional differences make it hard to unify 
And if you look at what's going on in our country right now, um, the po polarization is the is the opposite of unification, and we have a lot of polarization. And the reason is is because we're a very diverse nation, and it's hard to get diverse people all thinking the same way in the common interest. So so that's kind of the big picture. Um, we have a quiz this week, and again, I, I'm just pulling out some universal things on the quiz questions that I think are good for us to know to apply to any civilization. So one of the things that's been an issue in China forever was this population explosion. And one of the reasons that happens is because of advances in agricultural technology. Um, think of like faster growing rice, if you will. Um, think about a lasting era of peace in, in China. Um, immunities to disease, better growing conditions. All of these things add up to a population explosion. And it's not only in China. This happens everywhere. It happened in England in the 1600s. As more crops were introduced, the population expanded. So so on the quiz, one of the questions is going to be, um, what are some of the reasons for China's population explosion under the Qing dynasty? And um, so just what I said, a long period of peace, new crops from the Americas, faster varieties of rice are sort of the biggies. And then also as... As things advance, uh, immunities to disease, uh, better growing conditions, that sort of thing. So know the reasons for the China population explosive, uh, explosion. And, and then also be familiar with the debates on why industrialization didn't take off in China as quickly as it did in other places. And again, this is um, uh, our, our book's author, Diker, um, has a little debate in the book, and you can read about it. But uh, it's an interesting read, so be familiar with that. Um, the, the biggest thing in China, and it's kind of cool, actually, but, but the, the author argues, and I agree, that the reason industrialization is slower to take off in China is because the Chinese didn't, um, didn't really care about capitalism and devices and stuff, manufactured stuff. Uh, they were an agricultural community, and, and the honor of agriculture is really built into their religion, Confucianism. So uh, that's really the main reason industrialization didn't happen as quickly. And plus the fact, too, that it's a bigger country and it's harder to pull people together. So that's on the quiz this idea that agriculture is favored over industry in China, and that's why industrialization is slow to take off. Um, as far as other stuff on the quiz, as far as Japan goes, make sure you know what a shogun is, um, and then make sure you know about uh, uh, Tokugawa and um, Christians and how that all works, because there'll be a question about that on the quiz, I think. And then also, lastly, not to give the short, uh, the short shrift to... Uh, Korea or Vietnam, but they're the other important players in this time period in Asia. Um, the thing to know about Korea right now in this time period of the 1500s, 1600s, in there is that they're not in a they're not in a great space. I think the book calls it they're in a bad neighborhood, and and by that um, by that we mean that you know you have China on the west, um, Japan on the east, and Manchuria on the north of Korea. So they're surrounded by. Um, countries that have more of a tendency to invade, and that certainly happens in Korea. First with Japan um, in the in the 1500s, and then uh, by the early 1600s, this this threat from Manchuria in the north. So the long and short of it is, in the 1600s, Korea takes on a lot of uh, Chinese traditions, and they're very influenced by Beijing um, at the end of this era. And then also note of uh, Vietnam, and the important thing to remember about Vietnam for the purposes of this chapter is to know that uh, the French um, colonized Vietnam to some extent in the 1800s and start to get sort of involved in local affairs. And they're able to do this because Vietnam is undergoing a period of civil wars in the 1700s and 1800s. And again, sort of a universal rule of history that you know when there are civil wars in a country, the country is vulnerable for uh, outsiders to come in and have influence, and that's and that's exactly what happened in Viet in Vietnam by the French. And as we move forward into modern history and get into the Vietnam War in the 1960s and study the 1950s, this idea of French colonialism in Vietnam is going to come up again. So, um, bottom line is, with all four of these countries, Japan, China, Vietnam, and Korea, they have a um, um, interesting closed. Um, society, they have interesting closed societies, and because of that, trade with the West was always uh, heavily managed and controversial. 
Um, but as the story goes, the West is very aggressive and the Christian missionaries are very aggressive. So in the case of Japan, especially, um, you know, Christian missionaries will come in and basically start to overrun the place. And so Japan shuts that down. China deals with it in different ways. And Korea and Vietnam struggle with that influence from outsiders as well. So um, that's it for this week. Um, and, you know, understand again that all of these societies like the U.S. have gone through this sort of feudal era and start to modernize in, in this chapter um, in the 1600s, 1700s, and 1800s. So that's it for this week. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. If you have any questions, let me know. Take care.